Welcome back to MedBoard Visuals, a focused primary care board review where you can relax and study for the boards at the same time. Now, we are presently in the cardiology section, congenital heart disease, subsection hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, and this is a primary care board review. Let us begin. Unfortunately, this is way too common of a condition. Syncope, presyncope, sudden cardiac death. But why does this happen? That's the question. Fortunately, our patient was able to survive. So you get an EKG on the patient and you notice something. This patient has left ventricular hypertrophy. LVH defined as SNV1 plus RNV5 greater than 35 millimeters. LVH. In addition, there's also a positive family history of sudden cardiac death. Okay, let's go to the exam. And on exam, you notice something interesting. He has a harsh crescendo decrescendo systolic murmur, a systolic ejection murmur. But wait a second, this sounds a lot like aortic stenosis. And it makes sense because if this is hokum, the outflow tract is narrow towards the aorta just like aortic stenosis. So it makes sense that we would have a crescendo decrescendo type murmur like aortic stenosis. Now, the question is, how do we actually tell the difference between the two? Ah, so wait a second. You remember, let's do a maneuver to tell the difference between aortic stenosis and hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. And you remember that squatting actually pushes the blood or squeezes the blood up towards the heart. Increased blood volume should make an aortic stenosis murmur louder. But this murmur gets softer with squatting. It first sounded like this with standing, and now sounds like this with squatting. Ah, this could be hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Okay, so let's actually take a look at the physiology behind hokum. So here we have the heart in diastole and here in systole. And notice the thick septum and left ventricle on both of these hearts. Now, notice in systole, however, the septum is markedly thicker compared to diastole. This is one of the ways the obstruction occurs in systole. The other way the obstruction occurs is the anterior leaflet of the mitral valve will actually move towards the obstruction during systole. We call this systolic anterior motion of the anterior leaflet of the mitral valve. And notice this area right here actually gets narrow for both reasons. In addition, with SAM, this oftentimes induces a mitral regurgitation murmur as well. But what decreases that space that we circle, the outflow tract that is? Well, smaller LV volumes, example, dehydration, or more forceful contraction of the left ventricle. It will squeeze to a smaller volume. A smaller volume means less space. And guess what? A louder murmur. All right. Now, let's re-examine hokum with different maneuvers, noting that decreased left ventricular volume will make the murmur louder. This includes valsalva, exercise, and inhalation. And please see our heart murmur maneuvers video. And increased left ventricular volume will make the murmur softer for hokum, squatting, sustained hand grip, and exhalation. Okay, let's now take a look at a drawing of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. And I want you to note something. Hypertrophic cardiomyopathy can have variable forms. Sometimes the septum actually doesn't obstruct. It's just thick. Or sometimes the right ventricle is also very thick, and sometimes not. But when we look at the pathology, we see myocyte disarray, abnormal nuclei, and replacement fibrosis. You can understand by looking at this why ventricular tachycardia, or V-fib, can occur in whatever variable hokum that the patient may have. And note, hokum is typically diagnosed by echocardiogram or MRI. Okay, so with hokum, because the left ventricle is so thick, this usually presents as a type of diastolic dysfunction, congestive heart failure. And also, because of the thickness, subendocardial ischemia is also more likely to occur. All right, so what are the symptoms of hokum? Well, the patient may have angina. They may have dyspnea on exertion or presyncope, with an N there, presyncope or syncope, or even sudden cardiac death. 
All right, so let's summarize what we've learned up to this point. Number one, this is a dynamic systolic obstruction due to the septum bulging into the outflow tract in the systolic anterior motion of the mitral valve. So the mitral valve also likely has some mitral regurgitation due to the SAM. Number two, valsalva slash inspiration slash exercise all lead to decreased left ventricular volume. A smaller volume is going to increase septal obstruction. Number three, sustained hand grip, squatting, exhaling decreases the murmur. And let's talk a little more about sustained hand grip because I don't think we've mentioned that so far. So sustained hand grip increases peripheral vascular resistance. This is going to make it more difficult for the left ventricle to pump and increase left ventricular in systolic volume size, leading to less septal obstruction. Okay, let's talk about other hokum points. Number one, it may have a bifid carotid upstroke due to the dynamic double obstruction from the septum and the systolic anterior motion of the mitral valve. This is called pulsus bisferens. Number two, a leading cause of sudden cardiac death in young people less than 35. Number three, it's autosomal dominant, so screen first degree relatives. Now the medical treatment for hokum. Number one, avoid volume depletion. This decreases chamber size and worsens obstruction. We do not want this. Drink plenty of fluids. Next, avoid strenuous exercise. Remember, with strenuous exercise, this is going to increase the contractions of the left ventricle, leading to a smaller LV volume. And decreased left ventricular volume causes a greater obstruction. Avoid strenuous exercise. All right, beta blockers and calcium channel blockers are oftentimes used, beta blockers being first line. Now, these drugs decrease contraction of the left ventricle, resulting in increased LV volume. Now, a word about non-dihydropyridine calcium channel blockers, example of rapamil. Be careful because they may still cause vasodilation and obstruction. Do not use in patients with LVOT slash hokum who have severe dyspnea, volume overload, or hypotension at rest. Okay, let's now talk about surgical treatments for hokum. Well, we have a couple of options here. We can either do a myotomy slash myectomy, or alcohol septal ablation, which is essentially a controlled septal infarction by blocking one of the vessels or vessels leading to the septum. All right, on to our questions here. Question number one, aortic stenosis murmur increases with Valsalva while hokum decreases. True or false? All right, this is false. All right, let's review this. So Valsalva decreases blood volume to the heart. Aortic stenosis will therefore decrease while hokum will increase. Smaller volumes lead to greater obstruction with hokum. All right, on to question number two. Patients with hokum are at risk of sudden cardiac death. True or false? Unfortunately, this is true. Question number three. Diuretics should be used first line to treat hokum. True or false? Okay, this is definitely false. Beta blockers and sometimes non-dihydrocalcium channel blockers. Be careful with calcium channel blockers, however, as mentioned in this video. Diuretics can cause volume depletion, which will make the obstruction of hokum even worse. All right. Well, this now brings us to the end of this video hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Join us now for the next video in the cardiology section. And if you're watching us on YouTube, don't forget to subscribe, press like, and ring the bell for notifications. Thank you from medboardvisuals.com.